to the track. The wall makes the leap and makes the catch. Amazing catch by Junior. He got it. A perfect game. 13 strikeouts. And Barnes hit for high. What a special moment for Barry Bonds. Swing and a long drive. Deep to right. Going, going, going. Goodbye. He has done it. He has changed the game of the night. With one swing of his bat. Hello and welcome to the Champions Adjust podcast. This is episode 40 of the episode Champions. Episode 40. Of the Champions Adjust My podcast. God, we're episode 40. Old. Episode no, no. 40. Episode 40. Wow. But my name is Aaron Mashbitz. My Next name to is me David, is my co-host David Bodzin, Coach David Coach Bodzin. David Bodzin, and uh, we, worse. yes, we are the hosts of the Champions Just podcast. And <laughs> we started doing this a couple episodes ago, episodes ago, and I really like it. But this podcast is sponsored by Champions Adjust. Champions Adjust is a sports brand where we have a clothing line, we have this podcast, but our main area of focus is our mindset program. Coach Bozen is the pitching guru of that mindset program, and I am just overall uh, mental skills, mental performance, mental toughness coach. And so that encompasses the whole Champions Adjust and, brand. And do you know why Champions Adjust is a uh, sports brand? Why? It's because Champions Adjust, man. I mean, that's brilliant. It makes sense, right? It's brilliant. Oh, my God. Brilliant. So if you're a brand new listener or you're a returning listener, thank you for joining us. We have a few things we want to talk about today, but <clears throat> Coach Bozen... I was just thinking about this as we were sort of preparing for this episode. Sure. And I'm thinking about coaching. Obviously, I'm thinking about coaching a lot because that's sort of encompasses. You're doing it or like because you're already doing it? Right. It sort of encompasses my whole life. Sure. And this question sort of popped in my mind, and I think I want to start here with you, is that what do you think people, specifically maybe parents, miss or don't see or don't realize that coaches have to do um that's quite hard this <laughs> a lot a lot um I, I i don't know i think i'm an anomaly uh personally i don't i don't think there's a lot of coaches who put as much work into a weekend of youth baseball that i do Ex- expand um, i um i think i've talked about this on this before but you know we'll go through our, our saturdays and sundays you know that's our job is to coach the games right and our, our, our jobs customer facing I was like, I'm, I'm in sales. Our jobs in front of people is to coach the baseball game to the best of our ability, to mm-hmm. the best of the, to, to get the kids up to the best of their ability. And then on the other aspect is to prepare them for the weekend practicing, mm-hmm. right? What they don't see is the preparation that goes into the games and the preparation that goes into practices. For example, what I do after Sunday, we'll either win or lose our last game on Sunday. You always hope to win that last game, but you know, doesn't always happen. Um, you get home and you debrief, right? What I do is I sit down at my desk, whether it's one o'clock in the afternoon or 11 o'clock at night, and I write notes that are going on in my head and I kind of debrief and I, I journal, right? Um, that way when I wake up, you know, I'll, I'll wake up, I'll get my day going, I'll sit at my desk and I will email my parents a weekend recap. Mm of, you know, where we're at as a team, how we did compared to the past, how I feel like we're trending, and what we need to work on moving forward. Mm. From there, I put together the following weekend's uh, lineups. I start to work on, you know, this pitcher is going to have this defense behind them, and I want him to go this game, and then right behind him, I want this pitcher to go, but he's going to need a different defense because he's a different kind of pitcher, right? I need a stronger glove, and I'll sacrifice the arm at third base for a slower pitcher, right? I need someone who's going to knock the ball down Mm. versus, you know, someone who's going to throw harder. I need a stronger right side of the infield, Mm. right? And so I'll I'll, I'll mix and match that. And when I do that, y'all, I put that together for both games Saturday and then the first game Sunday, and then I will change it 10 times because at the end of the day, to me, early in the season is about, you know, kind of throwing stuff at the wall and see what sticks. I have a good idea of who's going to play where and and, and where's going to play best. But I need guys to play multiple positions, right? Um, on top of that, we go on, on our, our group chats and we'll talk for, 
you know, a couple of days about how we're going to run practices together, right. how that's going to look. Um, and the one thing that I don't do on the computer, but I still do all the time is I'll sit here and I'll think about how I can improve myself as a coach. How can I improve these kids as people and how I can improve these kids as players? So what that means to me is I have 13 players. They're all different personality types. Mm -hmm. I have multiple, multiple mental game of baseball books. And I'll just scroll through them and try to figure out, okay, I have this one player who's a little more temperamental. When things don't go well, things kind of fall apart. Mm -hmm. Okay, how can I get him to sit down and and breathe a bit? Mm -hmm. Well, I have these books. I'm going to go through that. And then I'll spend like 30 minutes on that one player. And then I'll go to the next player mm -hmm. and try to figure out how I can handle that player. Um, you know, one of the other issues that I have on my team, I'm just kind of like using this as an interview and telling everybody my process right now. Um, but I have, you know, a bunch of new players who have never met each other and they've never met me. So one of my biggest jobs I've taken on is that first month, we're probably going to lose a lot of games, but how are we going to mesh together as a team? Mm. And so I've been figuring out ways to do that, whether that be, you know, going to dinner out in Kilgore or my favorite thing we've done so far is I get up there for 45 minutes, I throw a BP, I'm throwing fastballs, sliders, changeups, curveballs, sidearm, and basically throw playing a game because I hit Coach Bodson. I'm throwing from 45 feet, just a different junk and see if you can get a hit off me. And it's good for the kids to laugh and get to know each other better that way, mm -hmm. right? And they're having fun with that. Um, and so, you know, they always say like, you know, you get closer with a common enemy and I try to make myself the com common enemy every so often so that they can jaw together. So all of that to be said that my job, as far as most parents are aware and most players are aware is I coach the game. Mm -hmm. And I coach practice mm -hmm. and a lot of coaches just show up and do it. But I take part in the fact that everything else I just described goes through my head and I work very hard throughout the week on top of my day job to ensure that I am giving these kids the best opportunity to develop as people and as ball players during the season. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of like the peek behind the curtains of what most people wouldn't see that you've seen. And you think I'm a freaking maniac sometimes because I'll be sitting at a diner making five lineups at once, but, um, well, I also, we don't need to get into the, the, the deep <laughs> insights of David Bodson's brain, but, but we've, I mean, we've been talking about this stuff since we were seeing, you know, we got our third year together coaching a team sure. and you know, I've, I've seen you transition into someone who like literally can't sleep at night because of this. And, yep. you know, maybe sometimes you still have that, but now you're able to still sleep sure. while still being able to care about the thing that you care about, which is why I journal. You know, so that's important, like trying to make that distinction. And it's the same way it goes for players, right? You have to be in love, borderline obsessed with this thing that you want to do if you want to do it at a high level for a really long time. Yes. But there has to be a separation between on the field and off the field. If yes. I'm with my girlfriend or if I'm with my partner or if I'm with my family, I'm with my family. But yes. when I'm on the baseball field, those two hours, three hours, whatever it is, well, that's when I'm entrenched. And then the same thing I do in my week, I have times blocked off where I'm going to work on baseball. Right. I have baseball practice, but how am I going to figure out my lineup? How am I going to figure out my kid that's struggling a little bit, but I know I can get more out of him. How do I get more out of him? Sure. What can I read? What insights can I gain to get more out of that person? Yeah, I just had a tough conversation with one of my kids at the end of practice. How do I start to rebuild or continue to grow that relationship so he trusts me? You know, all yeah. of those things. Well, the, and then you, hopefully you know that. But that's kind of the beauty of being a coach, right? And being a, a coach like like all four of us are is we know our players, right? So I did have a tough conversation with my players yesterday. Mm -hmm. But I have taken a lot of time to get to know that kid. Right. Over the last two, three months. So I trust the process and trust myself to know that I approach it in a way where he still trusts me and he still loves me as a coach because I didn't attack him because that wouldn't be beneficial to him. Um what you had mentioned earlier reminds me of something that Andy Lopez says over and over and over again. I've told, I tell all my teams and you've heard this before, mm -hmm. but you know, what, what coach Aaron just said was, you know, you still have to focus on your family and you still have to focus on your schoolwork and you still have to focus on your life. Um, Andy Lopez, Hall of Fame coach, I really would love to have him on this podcast at some point. Um, I think he'd be willing to do it. He, um, famous for saying that baseball is not life or death. Baseball is more important than life or death. What does that mean? It means that when you are on the field, you're, here's the field right here, and you step onto the field, 
nothing but baseball matters. Your obsession is completely focused on the game of baseball for the three, six, 12 hours that day that you're on the field. Mm -hmm. As soon as you get off that field though, and there's no more games to be played, this tiny baseball, tiny ball with 108 stitches, nine inches, five ounces, cannot control your life. Right. This no longer matters because your parents matter, your brother or your sister matter, your friends matter, more importantly, your faith, your schoolwork, your family, in any particular order, matter considerably more than this nine inch, five ounce ball with 108 stitches on it. This is nothing. Mm. Unless you're on the field, this is everything. And when you're off the field, who cares about it? Right. And that, that's, a, that's a skill that you have to acquire to be able to do that to be able to separate parts of your life. Cause then that, that tracks back into your identity about who you are as a person. And you're not just a baseball player. You're not a baseball player, right? Being a baseball right. player is part of your overall um, life. The identity is really about your repeated beingness. So who are you being? Well, on the field, I'm a competitive, ruthless, dominant athlete. Yes. Well, that's just part of your core value set. I'm resilient, I'm consistent. So those values show up everywhere. So that means your identity is all over those places. As a brother, I'm kind, I'm empathetic. You know, I show up for my family. Those are your values. So that's really your identity. Baseball is just a part of that. And it's really hard for all athletes, every single athlete at every single level to uh, understand that, that fact. Because we're, you know, we deal with it now. Like there's a guy who's been playing sports his whole life. He ends his, his professional career at age 39 and he has no idea who he is. Right. And right. so we can't expect 14 year olds to be able to do that, but we have to at least be able to give them the tools now. So when they do end their careers after high school, after college, God willing, after a professional career. Yes. Right. Then they like have some sort of foundation to sort of build this on so that they can be an amazing husband, an amazing friend, right? A business if they want to venture outside of baseball while they're still playing and right. grow that aspect of their life and things of that nature. And so, that's why I think it's so cool with with like well with working with these kids, yeah. You know because not everything we say clicks with them, correct. But the one things or the one or two things that do click, like is ultimately such a game changer. Yes. And that's really all I'm after as a coach is to have influence and impact. That's all that matters, right? And what we talk about all the time is 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 personal development, baseball development, winning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Winning's important in the greater scheme, right? Because you want to have fun and, and winning is the most fun. Mm -hmm. But it's not the only thing that makes it fun, right? And I'll give you an example. My team, I don't think we've talked about the, the Houston tournament yet. No, yeah. yeah, yeah. So my team went to Houston again, a bunch of new players, with a new coach, don't really know each other. Went up against three good teams. We lost seven to five, we tied six to six, and we lost uh, four to one. Mm -hmm. Five to two, five to two, excuse me. Um, I guess three good teams. And instead of, man, we should have won these games, it's more of a, and we're coming along pretty nice. And we're going up against three strong teams at a high level, at a very high level, and we're right there with them. Mm -hmm. This early on in the season, not really knowing each other yet, which means that our camaraderie will come along and our baseball IQ will working hard to increase. But our athleticism is taking over and we're a very athletic team. And we are going to win a lot of games once it clicks and it's closer to clicking than a lot of teams in this situation. And I think that's a huge, um, you know, I can't find words, but I think I think what one thing I'll, I'll hang my hat on is it's, it's a lot of hard work on the player's part and on my part to, as we're working together to try to come together and click. Right. Because a lot of teams in this situation take two to three years to find it. My job is to find it within a month or two. Yeah. And it's, you know, that to me is more important than winning. Because well, these kids are, because of what we're doing, these kids are going to be friends for a long time. Yeah. And they're going to get to know each other. And they're developing work ethic and people skills more so while we try to win some games, which is the least of my worries of yeah. the three. Yeah, the relationship building part <clears throat> is such a beautiful aspect of the game. Uh, I mean, we were, we were sitting down in Houston having yes. uh, food. And yes. two of your guys walked in who didn't who know, never known each other, didn't know each other, you know, four weeks ago and now are playing 
uh, hanging out, playing pool together, like just having a good time, that just being so awesome friends. To watch, man. And that's like, that's something that you're not going to think about as a coach if you're too concerned about with with winning yeah. and rankings and all of this stuff. Rankings that is somewhat important. Or you rankings as somewhat important as you as you get um, older. Sure. But the most important part, if you're actually if you're actually being present as a coach, is like watching your players and being like, oh, these two dudes are friends now. Yes. And they come from two different walks of life with two different backgrounds, two different families. And now they're just homies. And, and they text and they chat. It's and they amazing. Can, and every they practice, pick each other up on the field. And it's like, mm. Dude, every practice I show up and, I, and I, I watch for this. Every practice I watch for who's hanging out with who. And early on, it was these guys who already knew each other. And these guys who don't. And they're getting to know each other because they don't really know each other, anybody. But these guys are going to stick with their crew. And now... There's two or three factions, but it's always different. Mm. You got your three or four guys who are like best friends who never met each other. It's it's awesome. It's awesome to watch. But they're always like in different factions and different groups, right? Because, you know, it's tough to talk 13 people in a group. So they go like four, five, and four yeah. here. And they'll just kind of you know, shoot the shit. And it's just so cool to watch because these guys had never heard each other's names, you know, six months ago. And now we might be... One six and one or whatever we are, but we're getting along. Getting along, and we're 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 a fun team. And we're one six and one against really good teams, except for one. One team we should beat, but you yeah, know, the rest of them are we're very good teams. Um, just one thing I want to mention about my team in Houston. I think yes, it's please. important for for any coach or player, parent listening. Um, that was just very evident, uh, and I think a lot of teams face often. So we won our first two games. Yes, okay. and we yeah, we're in the winners bracket going into Sunday. And we come out really hot in the first inning and we score, I think we scored, you know, three runs. Yeah, I watched that game, yeah. And then in the bottom of the first inning, their team, the opposing team hits three bombs and I think pushed across seven. Yes. So in that moment, which every regular baseball team and young person will be like, like their initial reaction is like, oh shit, like this team is good. They just hit home runs. And so in that moment, you have two decisions to make. You can either make the decision to say, yeah, this team is good, but I accept the challenge, bring it on. Or mm, this game's done, I'm scared, and I'm gonna play scared, and I'm gonna play timid, and I'm gonna let them roll over me. We end up losing the game like 13 to three or whatever the case sure. may be. It's the only three runs where we scored in the first inning. The rest of the game, we didn't have very good at bats, and we played timid and we played scared because we saw the team was pretty good at baseball, they could hit a few home runs, and then we just decided that we're not going to accept the challenge. We don't want to bring it on. We don't want to take on this challenge because what if we do take on this challenge and we still lose? Then we're even more failures. But if we decide to just coast and give up, then mm -hmm. we could just say that we just gave up. Yeah, That's the internal dialogue. No one's saying this outside of their head or to me, but this is just something I can read. And so I think that's an important thing to happen early on in the season. Yes. You know, we had a game the, like the weekend before where we just gave up the game. We just decided not to show oh up. My that's God. an yeah. important game to that's have early in the season. That's the most upset I've ever seen you as a coach, by the way. It's Which, early career, but that's the most upset I've ever yeah, I just seen like, you, maybe ever. <laughs> you, were not, you were not thrilled. I wasn't happy, but I, but I also knew that it was an important part of our season. Yes. Like, this is a feeling that you need to sit with for a while. Like, you mm -hmm. decided basically not to show up to this baseball game. Yes. And maybe if you did full throttle, you still might not have won, but there's at least something to lean your head on at that, that point. That was the Dodgers game. Right? Yeah. 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 And so then this is sort of the opposite end of the spectrum. We showed up great in the first half inning and then got scared and played timid and decided to give up on the baseball did game. Did Tim Inns play timid? <laughs> <laughs> and so learning those things as a 14 year old is the most paramount thing. Because if you play baseball for a really long period of time, those games are going to happen. And baseball is built on momentum. And you can build momentum uh, with a young team very, very quickly with a couple hits here, with this here, with this, that here. And then you start to build momentum and you can score eight runs in an inning, six runs in an inning, seven runs in an inning. Anyone can do it. And so you have to be able to accept that challenge in the moment. Yeah, we're down eight. Yeah, we're down seven. Yeah, we just walked four guys in a row. But how can I accept the challenge? and bring it on no matter what the situation is and not get scared by someone hitting a ball hard or people having a few home runs, right? It doesn't matter. They're just regular baseball players playing a regular baseball game. Yeah. Every single team you play will have to throw the ball, catch the ball, and hit the ball. 
And if you can do those these things, those three things consistently great, you can be in any baseball game that's ever played. Yes. You have to throw, you have to hit, you we have to We talked about that last year. We talked about it. that last year with our team. Remember that we, we, we'd lost a string of games and I brought the guys together and we both talked to them about, you are better athletes and better baseball players than you give yourself credit to be. Mm -hmm. You are good ball players. You have to act like it. Right. You have to have a confidence. Don't be timid. Go do it. Mm -hmm. Go do it. And I like to say, you know, we're not going to win every game. But if you're going to lose, make them walk off on you. Mm -hmm. If you're going to win, beat the shit out of them. Let them know. Don't have it in between. And that's the goal is to get there, right? Right. And we got our team there as the year ended because we started walking off on teams instead of getting walked on. And we right. were beating up some teams too. And I think both of our teams are in similar spots right now. It's a, hey, we're, there. we're, we're trending. We're just not there yet. Right. Which you're not supposed to be. Right. It's freaking April. Like, not even mid-April yet, technically. Right. When this comes out, it will be. But it's it just, it's spectacular to, to me, that's the best part about coaching. 11U, 12U, 13U, 14U. And I'm sure, I've never coached high school, but I'm sure I'll feel the same way if I ever do. Is just watching the development of these kids learning how to navigate specific situations they've never really been challenged to navigate. Right. I'll say this, I've said it to my kids too before. They say, oh yeah, well this coach never did this. Guys, not every person you've called a coach is a coach. Some of them are just <laughs> guys who show up with a clipboard. Right, right. Happens. That's right. Are you coaching? Are you working hard for the kids? Or are you just showing up because it's a paycheck? And you know how I feel about that. It pisses me off, mm -hmm. right? You don't get paid enough in youth baseball to, to make a living off of it, so take it seriously. Same thing for Empire. Right. Show up and, and, and be on time and do things right. Have a plan and execute. So at the end of the day, it's so cool and so gratifying to me to watch these kids develop and teach them new ways to navigate life and specific aspects of baseball because a lot of them have never had a coach who cared enough to push them to that. Mm -hmm. So they had their parents. And... I know from coaching 14-year-olds and being a kid with a parent at one point that kids are more likely to listen to their coach than they are their parents right. at a certain age. And it's a discredit to those kids to have a coach who doesn't care about their personal development. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Not yep. at this age. Yeah. Yeah. You have people's lives at stake and yes. in your hands and you have to take that responsibility on and you have to take it on with, with the full commitment. And so it's great to be in these, in these types of games early in the season so kids can learn yes uh, it's great to get walked off on it's great to lose the close game it's great to get your ass just absolutely smashed to you it's great to give up the game and know that you didn't even show up it's great to know that you got scared yes so you have all these feelings in your back pocket so that you can play with them when the situation arises again because it will if you're yep. fortunate enough to play a lot of baseball games they will continue to show up over and over again. And then you can be like, oh, I've been here before. This is how I want to respond this time. This is how I responded last time. Here's how I can do better. And then you just start to improve. And the coach's job then is to facilitate that growth. And uh, that's important. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pumped with my team. Yeah, me too. Um, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, so that's really cool. Anything else you want to add about your team, coach? No, not yet, but I'm sure I will next week. Anything you want to say um, in regards to MLB baseball? Yeah, two things. One, your rookie of the year pick, Jordan Walker. Yeah. 20 years old. He's an absolute mammoth of a man. Though. The three That's longest so hitting streaks to start a career at age 20 or younger since 1900. 1939, Ted Williams started his career with nine straight hits. Ted. In 1912, Eddie Murphy. For the shirts, Eddie Murray. Um, started his career with 12 hits. And as of yesterday, Jordan Walker, after 111 years, tied Eddie Murray <laughs> for 12 hits. In his first 12 games, he hit <laughs> safely. More than 12 hits. A couple home runs in there, too. But guys, it's just he's funny. tied for the longest all-time Hitting streak to start a career. You said 112 years is hilarious that that Dude, baseball much, has been going right? on that long. Well, that's just the active ball era, right? right? The, the, the active, uh, not dead ball era, the active ball era. 1900 is when they started to keep these stats like, very closely. And 12 years later, Ed Murray shows up and, and hits you no know, safely in his first 12 games. 100, 
11 years later. Amazing. Jordan Walker shows up and does the same thing. Pretty cool. That is insane. Any thoughts on that? It, it's just like, it's, it's, it's almost unbelievable. Because it's like the same thing I talked about when you're having a baby. Unbelievable is not the right word because I believe you to be a good, that I knew you were going to sure. be good parents with Lulu, but it's unbelievable in the fact that it still happened and there's a human being, right? It's not unbelievable that Jordan Walker is hit safely in 12 games because he's an amazing baseball player sure. with a ton of skill, but it's still actually wild that it's happening. And in like, no one's done it in 112 years. Yeah. And he's still actually, he's still not even reached his close to his full potential is also the issue. Not right. the issue is also what's crazy because He's not being gap to gap. He's not hitting, he's not elevating the baseball yet, right? Because he's a home run guy. He can hit bombs. Yes. And right now he's just having base hits. So it's like he's still doing really well, but hasn't even reached his potential. Well, he was 0 for 3 yesterday and he still got his hit. Like it was a little seeing eye single. Yeah, he like, broke his back. Inning, yeah, it was incredible. Um, and so that's just really cool. Um, it's nice to see guys start off their careers hot who are highly touted, like big time prospects, because there's a lot of pressure that goes into that. There's a lot of expectation. And so things aren't going to go perfectly for him the whole year, right? He's going to struggle. Um, but at least he's on a good team with some veterans who can help him through that. But it's nice to know that he can do it because now he has a backlog of success. Yeah. So when he does go over, you know, 15 at some point in his career, he's like, well, I did, I've, I've done this, 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 this. I can do this before. I, I can hit baseballs. So Speaking of modern era records, the longest win streak for a team ever to start a season is twofold. It happened. Let's see here. Longest. I had. I actually had it open, and then I, I close it. In the modern era, it's happened twice at 13 games. The Atlanta Braves did in 1982. They started their season with 13 straight wins. 13. And then the Milwaukee Brewers in 1987, five years later, did the same thing. Started the game with 13 straight wins. The Tampa Bay Rays right now Right as we're talking, mm -hmm. on April 13th, Thursday, yep. this will come out April 15th, Saturday, yep. the Rays are tied with the Boston Red Sox in the third inning, one to one. If they win this game today, they will be tied for the longest win streak to ever start a season with the Braves of 82 and the Brewers of 87. And if they win tomorrow, they will have the best start in modern era history, 1900 and on, modern era history. So right now you have a player tied for the most games to hit safely to start a career and with a win today, another team at the same time tied for the most wins to start a season mm. since 1900. That's 123 years, man, that we've been tracking that. Some stats that we'll go with on the Rays because I pulled it up and I want to talk about it. Um, 15 to start like this, could we know that? Um, they've only trailed at the end of just five of their 108 innings this season. One of those games, I think I talked about it when we were doing our uh, predictions. I just popped on the Rays, and they scored five runs in the top half of the ninth. It was incredible to watch. Yeah, I watched um, the inning of baseball against the Red Sox yesterday of them, and they just smoked balls. They were just smoking baseballs. Speaking of smoking baseballs, they've hit 30 home runs to start the year. <laughs> That's the third most the team's ever done in the first 12 games of the season behind the 2019 Mariners. They hit 32, and the 2,000 Cardinals have hit 31. While they've done that, their run differential in their first 12 games has been plus 65. <laughs> they've outscored their opponents by 65 runs in the first 12 games. That is insane. And the only teams to ever be that good, run differential-wise, mm -hmm. in the first 12 games, were from 1884. 1884. 1884. Jeez, man. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Um, they are also uh, most consecutive wins all by four plus runs. They're fourth in the list now with nine. They all in all, that's just, I should have ended on that last stat, but I just didn't, hadn't scrolled down yet. <laughs> but that's incredible, man. Yeah. It's just what we're watching from an MLB perspective. Shows a lot to the kids that we coach, too. Jordan Walker, 111 years. Tim Bay Rays, 123 years. You can, and you will. Same thing I talk to my kids about when they're, they're, they're struggling. 
that you got to breathe because you can do this and you will do this. Mm-hmm. Just believe in yourself and it's trust possible. the process. It's possible. So that's all I got. That's a perfect way to end it. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Appreciate your support. That. Go to champsadjust.com. Champsadjust.com for all of your mindset, clothing, and podcast needs. But always, please remember that champions adjust. See you next time. Cheers.